Hello everyone, and welcome back to Let's Play 80 Days. I've decided that uh, other than doing the trip to Manila, uh, which I already did, we will do with San Francisco. I already had this trip, and I know where it leads. I checked my other place, and yep, that's the way I already took it. So we're gonna have to somehow... Uh, do it here. We'll negotiate so that it departs in four days and we'll spend those four days in Yokohama hoping for a better I say adventure with the last light of the evening I Went out to explore a little enjoying the sights and smells nothing So we could go to Manila today, but we won't we're gonna go to San Francisco in 16 days we will be there. So another day needs to pass. Uh, actually, is the market? No, it doesn't have anything new. So let's spend another day. As night fell, um, I engaged in another guest in conversation to learn what I could, but gathered what use. Damn, Yokohama is strangely unappealing. In two days. So let's spend another day, pass the night here. Before going to bed, I have the kitchen staff to clean. I spent a few hours walking around to see charming Chinese artists in a busy argument with a shopkeeper. From which I learned it can sometimes be prudent not to get in the way. I departed the scene with a torn shirt. <laughs> Okay, so tomorrow, I think. Yes. Oh! Okay, let's embark! Oh, higher extra space. Mouthsies! So, water will they? Man, they're doing really bad on money though. The water world was a sleek iron hulled ship to submarine prototype captained by a severe American by the name of Wicker, who wore a top hat <laughs> at all times and preferred tea to coffee, which greatly endeared him to Monsignor Fogg. In addition to the, un to the usual complement, the water world carried an entire corps of brass goggled engineers and a brace of submariners on standby, should the captain call the order to submerge. The rumor was that she had been a slave ship. It was a confederate vessel sold off to a private concern in the la later, more desperate stages of the Civil War. But I saw no trace of a dark past abroad. The crew seemed a happy family and welcomed us into their iron hard bosom. So I have to admit that every single time I played, I was I had so much money I didn't know what to do with them, but this time I'm really running short. San Francisco's importing piracy increase. Yeah, I know, it's the fog. Our cabin, while hardly spacious, was adequate to our needs. One of the midshipmen came by to show us how to use the pressure seals in case of submersion, but in all other aspects I looked forward to a peaceful steamship ocean crossing. I was not to be so lucky. Fog warning. Has gentleman lost mine? The salty air blew cool and sharp against my face as I opened the door onto the top deck. It was painfully early and the only passengers awake were a group of Chinese laborers hunched miserably near the stern. One of their number was vomiting Kapikus into a bucket. I offered him my own secret remedy which I had brewed up for just such an occasion. He swallowed it down with a certain dubious desperation, but immediately improved in both complexion and temperament. He thanked me most profusely. I asked him about the captain, but with no language in common, communication was impossible, so we settled into playing dice in quiet silence until sunrise. Damn, that's a long trip we have. 
I accompanied Monsignor Fogg to a game of whist with a family of American missionaries who were traveling back to San Francisco for a family wedding. My master began strongly, but Mademoiselle Loretta, the eldest girl, had a sharp eye and won several hands in a row. A new round was dealt. I noticed Mademoiselle Loretta slip a card in her sleeve. I blinked twice in pure astonishment and glanced up at her face, which was utterly calm, betraying nothing of the action of her nimble fingers. The minister's daughter was a cheat and a skilled one at that. I filled away the knowledge for an opportune moment, catching her eye to convey that I had noticed her little sleigh of hand. She blushed with all the manufactured prettiness of an accomplished actress and raised one eyebrow in silent challenge. Our journey continued on. Let's converse. Greetings, Reverend. Has part two. Good day to you. I'm very interested in San Francisco. They say that San Francisco is one of the most advanced American cities. Uh, can we go to San Pedro? Absolutely, you can get to San Pedro from San Francisco by fishing boat. The journey is a tiring one. What about Las Vegas? Excuse me, I must go now. We'll have to discover something there ourselves. I spent today in the company of the water lily submariners. They were all hardy men and women who preferred the dim and cold spaces of the hold to the top deck. Too much sky, one of them said, squinting suspiciously. Her crewmate nodded. All that fresh air! They shuddered collectively and suggested a bracing race to the boiler room. I impressed them with my physical prowess, coming in a respectable fourth just behind their commander. She was a half-Japanese, half-American sailor by the name of Davis. Izumi to my friends, she said, clapping me heavily on the shoulder. Now, a rematch of your choice. Very well, I declared, and promptly suggested a test of acrobatic skill. Though the submariners were all fit as horses, they had never attempted to, for instance, form a pyramid or walk the length of the corridor on their hands. They completed with me gameway, but admitted themselves outclassed. Commander Davis even applauded. Izumi nodded as I took my leave. You're not so bad. Police hunt card sharp known as the Reverend's Daughter, last seen Yokohama. Really? <laughs> I was climbing the rigging, rigging entirely innocently, as exercise of course, and not at all for the purposes of spying on the crew to appease my own rapacious curiosity, when I heard two of the crewmen arguing in a pidgin mix of English and Japanese. I closed my eyes and listened to their voices. Only a few words were audible over the howling of the water. Shrine, heaven, worship. Before a sudden scream rent in the air, one of the sailors was falling from the platform's edge. I was unable to look away as he fell. His body lay still and crumpled on the deck when I heard his scream in my head for days after. I looked up and managed to catch sight of the fallen sailor's companion. His face still and pallid. Was it guilt in his eyes or marrow shot? He slipped away before the captain arrived and I followed his example. All was clear and not well amongst the crew of the water lily. Greetings, Commander Davis. Monsignor Passport too, yes? San Francisco. The Americans are still recovering from their civil war, I hear. Can you travel from San Francisco to Salt Lake? Indeed, I knew a man who once took the Transcontinental Express from San Francisco to Salt Lake. Awesome. Uh, to Omaha. You mentioned trains. I've been told my brother... I've been told my brother always wanted to travel aboard the Canadian Pacific Railway from Gaston to Calgary. Omaha to Chicago. We got rid from Omaha to Chicago. Talk a lot, don't you? Okay. Oh, nice. That's a good 
good information there. The water was crew held a funeral for the dead sailor. I was not specifically invited, but felt a sense of responsibility, having witnessed the man's fatal plunge. Captain Vicker led the Christian service with customary grimness. I was surprised by the absence of the sailor's companion, who had been arguing with him just before his fall. Yet he was not the only one missing from the funeral. Oddly, only half the crew had come to pay their respects. I went in search of the rest, only to find them making an offering in front of a makeshift Shinto shrine in the crew quarters. The fellow from the night before was amongst them. The captain doesn't want us and his Christian ceremonies. He thinks nothing of our faith, one of the sailors told me bitterly. We make our offerings here instead. International Jewel Thief, the Black Rose, Fox's French Police. Could she be the rose that we met? <laughs> Storm, too exhausted to write the proper entry. Suffice to say, we are still afloat. As we settled down for the night, we were struck by an unrelated fog. Once in your fog, the date line. I have altered our watch already, Monsignor Fogg replied calmly. Did you think I might forget? My master was, of course, correct. With an eye such as his, it was unthinkable that he might miss such a detail. He had reached the, we had reached the point directly opposite Greenwich, where the hours we had lost in traveling around the earth were added back. A whole extra day. Awesome! So we have day more. Fox said you have crossed the date line. How far are we? Uh, about halfway through. Yesterday's storm hit us with wood warning. One moment I was preparing Monsignor's fog shaving water to exactly the right temperature, the next we were big tossed from one end of the cabin to the other. We were only lucky that the bed was securely nailed to the floor. The ship shuddered and moaned as the seas flickered with lightning. The storm lasted nearly six hours and blew as far of course. The captain spent most of the day peering at his charts trying to locate our position. There's no land anywhere up on the horizon. Oh no! God damn it! The captain announced a change of destination. The waterway would now make for nearby Hawaii rather than San Francisco. We would make port in Honolulu in five days and would have to find our own further, own further conveyance from there. Monsignor's fog whips pressed ever so slightly together, a rare outward sign of entire understandable annoyance. This, my master said, will not do. Indeed not, sir, I agreed, not even daring to calculate the delay and expense our unexpected diversion would cause. Monsignor Fogg gave me a cool, appraising glance. Captain Vicker has reneged upon his word as a gentleman, he said curtly, before lowering his voice to an almost furtive undertone. Our course is clear, we must mutiny. I opened my mouth to agree, wholeheartedly, but he continued on with out so much as a pause. See to it, passport to use your natural charm, I interjected politely. Quite, he said, with the agreeableness of a gentleman who just has given his wallet a near Herculean task. We will mutiny in five days when we reach Honolulu. Make your preparations as you see fit. God damn it! What am I supposed to do? Honolulu threatened by cattle influenza. My task was clear. I was to foment mutiny aboard the water line. I decided to begin by exploiting the crews and the monsters they towards one another. Divide and conquer, or so dear Maman always consult. Inclusive in inflaming their religious passions, gossip and rumor would be a good way to start. Their religious passions, though such passions were by their nature unpredictable, so I decided to. Wow, desecrate the Shinto shrine, steal the captain's wall-mounted crucifix. 
Still the captain's well-mounted crucifix and Wayne the theft upon the Shinto crew members. The captain took the theft as a personal affront and ordered a humiliating search of the crew's quarters. The officers destroyed the Shinto shrine in their search and several of the crew were dragged off to the brig for fighting. Jesus. Honorable beleaguered by telegraph lines. It was with satisfaction that I noted a certain increase in tension aboard the water lily. A situation that would carefully have to exaggerate in my master's mutiny was to have any chance of success. Next, I attempted to integrate myself with Commander Davis and the submariners who were rather storm-tossed and disgruntled. There are no storms underwater, the commander muttered, her hair a tangle underneath the cap. We should have submerged, I agreed. Captain Vicar risked all our lives. I think perhaps he does not trust your ability as submariners. The commander's face darkened at my assertion. Perhaps you are right at that, she said. Perhaps so. I have heard him say as much, I added, hoping to press my advantage. The commander's eyes narrowed suspiciously. Is that so? Why would he say such a thing to you? I nodded and winked. You do not know everything about me, I replied. The commander stared back, unflinchingly, keeping her thoughts to myself. To herself? I took my leave a moment later, hoping my seeds of doubt would spread. Wait. Copenhagen bomb threatens threat continue. Oh my god, look at the time! I had attempted to suborn the obvious targets aboard the water level, but wars were often won by the unexpected. With that in mind, I turned my attention upon the ship's artificer, a tall, rather imposing woman in a short jacket embroidered with the guild's copper lily. Artificers were notoriously neutral in the manner, matter of conflict or civil disruption. But I bribed her 50 pounds. Or rather, I should say, I tried to bribe her. She stopped me before throwing the money at my feet. Do not ever try to bribe. Yeah, I thought it was a mistake. But throwing at the mercy. Honolulu importing telegraph lines. Oh my god, how much further are we? I spent the day putting the last finishing touches to my plan mutiny. It was a matter of a, as delicate and serious as the creation of souffle by Master Chef. I spread word of my s signal amongst my allies and stayed up late, ensuring every man and woman on my side was true. Day 50. Ah! We reached Honolulu in the dark. The captain took a small skiff into the harbor with a few of his officers, wishing to inquire about repairs before putting the water away into dry dock. Once in your fog, watch the boat for a long moment. Now is the time, he said crisply. I trust everything is in order. I assured him it was, and he nodded, having expected no other response. What does hope so? With that, my master retreated to his cabin, and I called the signal to arms. The water will erupted into chaos. Everywhere was the clash of sabers and pistols. Now and then, I heard the shriek of the officer's sonic weapons, but I was not alone. The half of the crew that followed the Christian faith fell in behind me with a rallying cry. They fought their Shinto crewmates with vicious determination, clearing the top deck within the hour. The Chinese laborers rewarded my friendship with steadfast loyalty, throwing themselves in the mutiny with all the desperation of men and women who utterly loathed sea travel and longed to revenge themselves upon their instrument of torment in any fashion. They lit fires and tore up the already ragged sails, causing some welcome chaos. The submariners, led by Commander Davis, charged out of the hold of the ship like a horde of impossibly athletic avenging angels. There was a long and terrible moment when I announced at their allegiance. The Commander Davis caught my eye and winked. It's Izumi to my friends. She shouted cheerfully, driving back and strangers well to Captain Vicar. I saw Mademoiselle Loretta trip up one of the loyal officers out of the corner of my eye. She tipped her bonnet in my direction, a gesture of respect from one player of the game to another. The vero of the battle took me away, but not before I saw her falsify a magnificent feint and block the gangway to the navigation room. 
By noon it was clear how the day would end. The mutineers raised a ragged cheer of victory. I myself had ended up with a debonair scratch upon the cheek and had somehow come to be in a possession of a brace of pistols and three sabers. By the time the captain and the officers returned we had completed control of the ship. They were quickly thrust, thrust up and uh, thrown in the brig or returned to their scape. Thrown in the brig for safekeeping. Monsignor Fogg emerged, surveying the scene of recent battle with the calm eye. Well done, he said, with classic gentlemanly understatement. Still, it was well done, and more, if I do say so myself. So we're continuing our way... well... <laughs> my god, we're not gonna make it this time, I think. Or, you know, I made it twice, and now the third time I'm gonna fail. Mysterious French pirate sees a steamer of Costa Monodou. This is gonna be awful. To my amazement, the successful mutineers held a vote and elected me the new captain of the water lily. I was delighted. Can you imagine, my friends, your humble passepartout, captain of his very own ship? Rest assured, mes me, it was in great part a ceremonial title which made no particular demands on my seamanship. Monsignor Fogg, though pleased by the success of the mutinous endeavor, Seem to regard my elevation in rank with some bareness. I am, he admitted, as we prepared for battle. Somewhat put in mind of Bonaparte. Part there. <laughs> Not 20 days. I think that in both other plays I had on my phone, I was by this time already in London. The, the Bluewitz reports Austro Hungary running for war. <laughs> The new first mate, a cheerful girl by the name of Wang, came to me with an intriguing notion. As you know, the water weather is a ship to submarine prototype, she said. If the submariners cooperate, we could convert to submersible and make port at San Francisco in two days rather than five. I called in Izumi, who greeted me with a flourish and a bow. My dear captain, she declared, not bothering to hide her amusement. Do you have orders for me? Can you get us to San Francisco in four days? His miss eyes sparkled. Captain, I have been waiting for death order all my life. I will make preparations and we will submerge tomorrow at dawn. San Francisco beleaguered by gold prices. Izumi was a woman of her word. At dawn, the water really began its preparations to submerge. I can record the technical particulars of the enterprise, but my own experiences were thus. The ship began to groan and scream as the iron hull shifted to cover the top decks. The sails furled as the masts collapsed. The screw propelled engines transformed themselves. Bells and alarms sounded as the bulkheads were closed and sealed. Within an hour, the water level had transmuted from a surface skimming steamer to a watertight submarine. Izumi tossed me a fearless grin as she called for us to descend. My ears popped as we punched ever deeper into the water of the Pacific Ocean and a curious sounding silence descended upon the vessel. Go, go, go. Then Marina born Lina Palkala heads for Tehran. Newly discovered from Nosorosisk from Mount Elbrus to Tehran. I think we'll have to take some money from the bank. I had little to do but pace the preternaturally quiet corridors of the submarine. Izumi and her crew were in firm and able control. I resolved to enjoy myself. I was still captain of the water lily, even in her new configuration. The crew saluted every time I happened to saunter into their vicinity. On the whole, I would rather recommend submarining to the discerning <laughs> I'm a discerning traveler. We surfaced a few miles out from San Francisco. Apparently a submarine emerging without warning in a harbor could cause all sorts of misunderstandings and complications. Izumi recommended that we row into the port on a skiff. I have formally renounced my captaincy to Izumi, as she was clearly the most capable sailor about the water women. She watched in pleasure 
and seemed unaccountably delighted. Good fortune, Passepartout, she called as we rode away. You always have a home aboard the water, Lily. I turned towards San Francisco, still shrouded in a pale pre-dawn white. We have gained three days, my master said, and I couldn't help my answering smile. And here we are in San Fran. 